and we're live. Welcome to MHTV. We're really, really pleased to have you with us tonight. Um, tonight's subject is, well, we've got two or three subjects we're going to be covering. We'll be delving into the world of paramedics, and we're also going to be looking at NHS pay and strikes and things like that as well with colleagues who have union backgrounds. So I think that will be a really useful and interesting um, episode for you guys to be part of. So I'll hand over to Dave so he can show you how you can ask questions and jump join in. Dave? Hi everyone, nice to see you. Uh, it's Dave here and yeah, like Nikki says, uh, there's a couple of ways you can join in tonight. The first one is over on the right side, uh, Facebook Live. Uh, if you just type in your comments or your questions, we'll try and bring some of those in tonight. Uh, and then over on Twitter, if you want to use the hashtag MHTV, uh, you can also tweet there and we'll hopefully pick up any comments from there too. But without further ado, straight back to Nikki. Okay, let's go to our fantastic guest. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for uh, joining us. Shall we start with Gary? Gary, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? I can. Good evening, Nikki, and everyone else. So I joined Quick Career Resume, joined the ambulance service in 1991. What made me join the ambulance service? Surprisingly enough, my dad was in the ambulance service, and the number of father, son, daughter, yeah. Uh, sort of careers that have developed over the years. So I've only ever known the ambulance service. So I joined the ambulance service in 1991, started as a technician, as you did in those days, around five years later, became a paramedic, and I've been a paramedic ever since. So that's quite a long career, and as you can imagine, that's seen quite a few changes mm -hmm. in every way, shape, or form, from the way you transport a patient into the back of the ambulance, to the mm -hmm. high tech sort of care that we deliver to patients these days and the multiple things that we need to think about when we're delivering those care. Brilliant. And what about you, Steve? How did you find yourself in this world? Uh, almost by accident. I was a toolmaker that had returned from living in Australia for two years after a failed emigration attempt um, or immigration attempt and um, came back to England. I was out of work for about uh, six months in 1993. Um, and then somebody suggested, why don't you look at the ambulance service? In those days, I thought you had to have some kind of medical background or qualification and such like. So I inquired and I entered through the patient transport service, uh, applied for that um, in the August of 1993, uh, passed the entry test and everything, got offered a job, um, spent two years on that and then applied for the three year paramedic course that they were running at the time. Went for that and at the end of the three years qualified as a paramedic in um, 1997 and like gary was saying that the, the amount of changes that have that have occurred over that time uh have been absolutely massive and then around about 2007 ish i well i got involved in the union side of things around 2004 2005 as agenda for change was coming in mm. uh, and I did know somebody that was at an early implementer site. So at work, I was going, when some of the reps were talking about bad things on station, I'd be going, no, that's not quite right because, and you okay. want to have a look at that and whatever. And then eventually when a spot became available, one of the reps moved on into a managerial career. I was then approached and asked if I would would like to pick up the, what was the junior reps role at the time um, at Coventry Ambulance Station. And then it quickly developed as we moved into um, we were Coventry and Warwickshire at the time, then we moved back into the West Midlands and then I became a regional rep. And then as things have gone on, I've gone through the ranks to the senior rep and branch secretary and such like within, within our branch. Mm. I think it'd be good for us to get on to um, trades union roles and, and how people become reps in a sec. But can we circle back a little bit to you? Both of you have mentioned the huge changes that you've seen in your career. So what are those changes? What are the biggest changes you've seen in paramedic services? I'd, I'd say the quality of care that we deliver mm. and the, the sort of environment in which we deliver that care. So it is pressurised, it's scrutinised, you have numerous pathways to, to sort of consider these days. So, so everything is much more high tech in every possible way. So there's an awful lot of pressure on the paramedics, but the pressure on the paramedics also comes from the general wider NHS system as well. In the, you know, in days of old, you would go to a patient, you'd treat the patient, you'd take the patient to the hospital if appropriate, you'd go on to the next call. There are lots of pressures on ambulance staff now as a result of the, the, the hospital backlogs that you get, the under the wider underfunding of the NHS. And often you'll you'll speak to paramedics these days and the the key phrase or saying that they say is, I didn't sign up for this. 
Mm. And I didn't sign up for this. What they mean is I didn't sign up to stand for six, seven, eight hours on a corridor to then go to a patient who's been waiting six, seven, eight hours for an ambulance. Mm. So all the, the sort of wider NHS pressures that you've got seem to funnel. I know yeah, every member of the NHS and, and you know nurses, doctors, everyone feels it. But sometimes it feels as though it all neatly funnels to the ambulance staff that have to go to that patient that's been waiting an excessive mm -hmm. amount of time. So I think it's the wider NHS pressures that really are, are squeezing the NHS staff at the moment. Mm. It's incredibly distressing, isn't it, to have in your head how you mm. know good care should look and then yeah. have this awful feeling that you're always trying to claw to catch up to it. It's, a, it's really distressing for staff, I think. So what's the biggest misunderstanding people have about, about your roles, do you think, as, as paramedics? I think the wider NHS don't have a full appreciation of what we can do mm -hmm. and what they can do on the back of a vehicle and what kind of care they can, you know, the paramedics in particular can deliver. Mm -hmm. um, and then you, you go down all the way down to public perception, which is you know, a very minor injury or, or whatever that really doesn't need hospital treatment or such like or hospital assessment, but they still think that they've got this right to call for us. And I think, again, that is another element of the pressure that's on, on staff these days because, mm. you know, knowing full well that there could be a lot of vehicles queuing at a hospital waiting to get sometimes quite critically ill patients in, but they can't because they haven't got a bed. And yet their next call, once they clear from that, could be somebody who's, I don't know, sprained a finger or something like that, or, you know, has had a nosebleed for five minutes and, and they haven't even properly attempted to, to stem it. So I think there's, there's that element as well, because there's always that requirement to remain professional, to remain polite and, and such like. Because, again, you know that if, if you don't, anybody can complain about you these days and you know there's, there's this thing about you trying to deliver the, the op optimum care for people and the most professional care like gary was saying what, we, what we've been trained up to and everything mm. and yet there's always this pressure of somebody could complain about me mm. and we, we see that you know we, we see that at work in in our other roles um and i do find that it's almost like it, it feels unfair sometimes because once they get to hospital, they're happy that they're at hospital and, you know, that kind of pressure from them or angst and whatever is is mm. relieved because they're in the hospital, which is where they wanted to go to. Mm. Um, but then, unfortunately, for the crew, once they've cleared, like I say, it's mm. then the next job. Mm. And I think one of the things that I was going to say as well that's added to the pressures these days is during the COVID period, when we weren't going out to as many patients or when we're at hospital, we're not seeing as many patients but the crews aren't, and especially the, the newer, younger paramedics or paramedics that are new into the service, mm. they're not getting the exposure and the experience. So mm. as things have started to pick up, you know, the workload and everything and, and the volume of work, because they haven't been able to, you know, gain that experience properly, they, they are, some are struggling a little bit and, and their confidence levels, and all it is is about building them up and, and reassuring them and letting them know you know this is what it used to be like because back in my day you'd work with people and you know you'd be working with um technicians and such like you wouldn't have had that much support during your training periods and everything and it was a case of muddling through mm. it feels a little bit like that now and it shouldn't be not with everything that we've put in around newly qualified paramedics and everything they should be getting a lot more um i think probably more or better support, you know, of a better quality. But like I say, the fact that we've almost turned it around by not being able to get out to patients to give them that exposure, it's 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 very trying for them as well. Mm. It's a stressful thing, isn't it? Whenever you've got that system stretch, you always seem to get that gap in supervision that's so important mm -hmm. for for newer staff members. Yeah. So what's the best thing about being a paramedic? If you were going to recommend your calling, <laughs> what do you love about it? Well. Uh, yeah, I was I was thinking about your previous question, really, mm. but I think oh, the oh. answer to the previous question is the best thing about being a paramedic, mm. and that's the the broad range of skills that you develop mm -hmm. and the broad range of experiences. <laughs> there, there isn't really another job where you 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 have often the privilege of going into people's houses in really difficult situations, yeah. and some of those may be 
really critical medical situations, there may be mental health presentations, or there may be social care issues. Mm -hmm. But each one of those is equally as rewarding. And when you look back on your shift and you look at the range of people that you've helped over the, the number of jobs you've done in your shift, that mm -hmm. I think is where the satisfaction lies. So when I think of the jobs that I've enjoyed most or mm -hmm. gained the most satisfaction from, it's not high profile, blood gore, jobs like that. Mm -hmm. It's dealing with people that are either vulnerable, isolated, have fallen through the cracks in, in social care and things like that. So it, it sounds like a cliche that, you know, you, you do make a difference, but it, it's really true in all these different situations. Mm -hmm. And I think it's the fact that I can't think of another career or another job that gives mm -hmm. you that broad range of exposure to, to mm -hmm. patients and a broad range of patients, really. That's what I find rewarding. Mm -hmm. I think I can remember the times when I've called for an ambulance and when you see the paramedic turn up, I cannot tell you the feeling that you have. Such relief. Yeah. It's like the cavalry arriving. It's amazing. <laughs> it is. And you, 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 you pick up on that. And with experience, mm. you, you know, mm. experience is a wonderful thing, isn't it? Mm. You learn to, to read the room, to deal with the room, to put people at ease. And mm. all those people skills that the job teaches you are really invaluable. Mm. And I think as well, when you're supporting people who are under pressure, who are frightened or overwhelmed, yeah. or maybe don't hear you the first time, that's such a highly skilled job. People maybe don't recognise that. Yes. Yeah, no, I, I think you're right. You, you learn how to react in situations that most people would, would react in a default way. You mm. learn, learn to take two or three steps back. And, mm. and really, it's <laughs> empathy, isn't it? It's understanding that the person that you're going to may have waited eight hours for an ambulance and they are going to be stressed and they are going to sound off to you mm -hmm. and it's having the empathy to understand why they're sounding off to yeah. you to reassure them bring them round and deal mm -hmm. with whatever the problem is that's led them to call 999. Mm -hmm. um, and before we move on to union stuff and obviously we will be using on to union stuff otherwise Dave will just turn us off yeah. <laughs> if we don't <laughs> so we need to think about just um, for anybody who's watching and has actually really inspired and wants to be a paramedic, what kind of qualities are you looking for um, in somebody who wants to be a paramedic and how do people go about training? I think you've got to have a level of empathy to be able to to, to make that contact with people. Um, I've always said that, you know, if you have sympathy with people, you, you'll just completely burn yourself out you've got to have but you've got to give yourself that empathy to be able to to understand and, and have an, a kind of rounded kind of um, view of what's going on with with somebody and like Gary said with the experience you learn how to deal with that um one of the things that makes me smile all the time is when people say I just want to help people well yeah you can help people but then they, they sometimes come into the service and then they soon realize that this may not be the job for them because of all the the add-ons and everything yeah. i think if somebody really wants to um become a paramedic look beyond the tv programs because obviously yeah. they're quite heavily edited a lot of the time um and maybe go and have a look into the role itself properly and see what's what's required check out the HCPC and all the requirements and proficiencies of practice and everything. Mm -hmm. And if they can associate with some of those things, I think it will probably give them a better understanding of what the role actually demands because mm -hmm. being professionals, being registrants and such like, there is that element. Mm -hmm. um, and like I say, it's not always like it is on the TV. So yeah. Yeah, you've got you've got to have that kind of caring attitude. You've got to want to to help people but in the right way because if you're overly caring sometimes some of the jobs that you may go to could destroy you so you've got to have a, a bit of a a realistic and a real view of of what you could potentially be seeing and such like because yeah. you know gary will probably tell you as well we have we have members of staff that sometimes they'll see something that they were never never prepared for mm. Mm. Yeah, really important. And I think, you know, obviously, as paramedics, your job is to to look after members of the public. But as, as union 
leaders. Your your job is to look after your staff as well. And it seems like that's a really vital role. Um, I think Steve, you, you told us a bit about how you came into sort of union work. But Gary, did you did you mention how you ended up as a as a voice for this? Yeah, I managed to dodge that question, didn't I? Um <laughs> but do you know what? Yeah, I I'm I'm, I'm tempted not to tie it down to a Bolshe email, but it was a Bolshe email. <laughs> um because it was around the time of the, the paramedic rebanding, because for many years, paramedics were band five on Agenda for Change, which when you looked at intubation, all those other things did seem rather an injustice. Mm. So we had many years of, of, you know, looking at the paramedic banding and the banding review that went on forever. So I did send an email at two o'clock in the morning, which is never a good time to send an email to our, our branch secretary, sort of saying, you know, what is going on with this? Rant, rant, rant. And he sent, you know, a, a sort of ranty one back. And I thought, Do you know what, you really are working hard on this. And I didn't perhaps understand how hard you were working yeah. for a, a subject that was dear to my heart and everyone else's heart. And mm. after that, I phoned him up the following week and sort of made that decision that actually I think I'd rather be involved with things, trying to steer things on the inside of things than on the outside and sometimes frustrated, really. So that was around 10 years ago when I became a workplace rep. And I'm a bit of a, which is why I'm here today, a bit of a compulsive volunteer. Yeah, I'll do that. I'll put my hand up. I'll do that. I don't mind. So then that brings us all the way to where we are now, where I'm the Unite Lead and Branch Secretary in the Northwest Ambulance Service and sit on the OPC. Uh, Steve's the chair and the vice chair. Mm -hmm the health NISC, the regional groups, et cetera. So once you become more involved with each facet of the union, you find it's a bit like a jigsaw and, and you work out how all these different pieces come together and how each part of the union is dependent on the other part and feeds into it, if you will. So yeah, in answer to your question, it snowballed from a bit of a bolt email around 10 or 12 years ago. I think we've all learned never send an email at two o'clock in the morning. Never. Do that. <laughs> no, 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 you learn. Send it to yourself and then review it when you've calmed down. <laughs> yeah, or even sit on it for two days, as I will now. Your experience is a wonderful thing. <laughs> so we will take a deep breath then. Let's think about how um, what your experience has been with kind of like NHS pay over the last year or so and, and how maybe this sort of strike action has come about. If you could explain. Because I think people keep their heads into their own professions and each of the professions has got its own issues. It'd be really interesting to understand what your experience has been. I think for, what, for one thing, because um, I sit on the NISC ex officio, um, we've we've kind of like sat at the NISC and, and various other meetings, Gary and I, and we've we've had discussions around where, where any potential dispute could go. Um, and we're always acutely aware that you know, 2014 could have been replicated. And, and I think it, in fairness, it has, whereby the ambulance sector in particular um, was at the forefront of of um, action then. And, and so it seems to have occurred now as well. Um, and we, we've been warning, we've been warning this for probably the best part of 12, 12, 18 months when we knew that the 22-23 the pay deal was going to be coming up. We knew that we weren't going to be happy with it. We knew, obviously, with the regime that's in charge at the moment, that it wasn't going to be above inflation and such like. And it was really about getting prepared. And, and with Colenso and the other officers and that, we 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 started preparing and, and getting ready for this moment, to be perfectly honest. Mm. And, and it's, I was talking to somebody the other day, and I said, when we sit back and look at it, Gary and I in particular, because our two branches were were the, the two bigger ones that, that met the threshold originally um, back last November, December time. But even before then, we had the consultative ballot and then we were preparing for the consultative ballot. So it's almost like we've been on a war footing almost, for want of a better term, but mm. it, I think people will understand. We've been on that kind of footing since probably early to mid-summer and as we've gone along, it's started to build up, build up, build up. The, the pressure's escalated. Um, and I was saying to somebody, it's like the, the, the impact of the, the pressure of expectation. Mm. And that expectation comes from all angles. It comes mm. from your membership that look to you for leadership and answers when they're asking you questions and such like. 
It comes from regional officers that are involved and are supporting you as well, mm -hmm. right the way up to the top of the union. Mm -hmm. Because once once we got through that threshold and, and met the requirements, literally within days, it was like, what are you doing? What's happening? Mm -hmm. And, and it, it, it just continues. And it's it has continued um, to where we are now. So, and when we when we were informed last week that, you know, that a an agreement had been reached that there was something to send out to the membership, a lot of people probably sat back and thought, but for the likes of me and Gary, it's like, mm. well, now we've got to go out. I've, I've got a week this week mm. due to my annual leave next week. But because of that, I've got all of this week going to meetings and such like meeting with members, as I said earlier. And and it's, it's going to be probably like that until we get the results. And then from there, it'll be determined what we do next. But it has been quite a long, sustained period. And I don't think we even, you know, Gary and I didn't even realise this because Gary yeah. and I have been quite a lot, you know, quite constant contact, regular contact with each other, obviously. Mm. Uh, and it was only when I sat back the other day and thought this, I thought, my God, you know, how have we survived this up till now, to be perfectly mm. honest? Because it has been quite intense at times. Mm. You've triggered the first question, actually. Well done, you. <laughs> and I've got the rather bizarre nips question mark. And I hopefully I think you were saying NISC. OK, so yeah, that's, that's <laughs> not that kind of a conversation. So, Steve, could you just um, tell us what that is? <laughs> NISC, please. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, about? so it's our, it's our health health sector meeting. It's the National Industrial Sector Committee. So the health sector of Unite. Yeah. So who sits on that? There's approximately 42 members or delegates to it. I mm -hmm. sit ex officio, as I say, uh, mm -hmm. because I report back to it because currently I sit on the executive council for the NISC and whatever I got voted in. Um, so I report back um, from the EC to them. Yeah. Um, but there's 42 members made up of various um, roles and professions um within the union um dave's probably a better place to tell everybody really than me there's yeah. everything from bio uh, biomedical scientists uh estates yeah. uh, ambulance yeah. service you name it yeah it makes sense. cphvas and everything we, we cover the whole quite a large range of, of roles and yeah. professionalism or yeah, yeah. And this has been building for a long time by the feel of it. So um, for either of you guys, what kind of steps did you have to get take go through before you could start thinking about strike action? Because it almost feels like it was an inevitability in some ways. Yeah, you had you had the consultative ballot. And although <laughs> it might feel inevitable and although you had a massive strength of feeling really across the country, mm. the challenges of, of getting a, a, a ballot through these days you know with the anti-trade union law is is really challenging yeah so so we had you know the consultative ballot and then the main ballot and we utilized every tool that we had such as phone yeah. banking and from our from our point of view there were unintended consequences positive consequences because you you're really linked in with your membership in a way that perhaps we hadn't done for many years because you know, with, with, you know, time pressures and, and, and everything that's going on. But actually, you'd have a phone bank going, you'd be sat there with your headset on, and you'd be speaking to member after member after member, talking about the, the pay ballot, why mm -hmm. there's a pay ballot, talking about the pay offer. So, so that real one-to-one -one engagement with members was invaluable. And I know yeah. Steve described the build-up to this, and the, the phrase, I would have used is a pressure cooker and it has been like mm. a pressure cooker building for yeah. the last year really and mm -hmm. you know it's not just the last year is it because it's 10 years of underfunding it's yeah. 10 years of below inflation pay rises it's you know year upon year of the vacancy numbers in the NHS growing and yeah. growing and growing I was at a, a health conference probably two years ago and I think the figure was 80,000 vacancies mm. at the last sort of um, time this was discussed, I think it was 130,000 vacancies. So mm. all these things have built sort of the pressure cooker effect that, that we've had, which has led us A, to the consultative ballot, 
Yeah. Um, and be the strike action that's followed from that. Mm. It's interesting, isn't it? Because I said, I mean, these laws were brought in to make it more difficult for people to strike. Effectively, yeah. that's what it's about. And what it's actually done is just rile everybody up and get them more informed, which is uh, mm. interesting. <laughs> it, it has, and, and you know, the sort of the legislation with what seems to be the aim to make life difficult. You know, the minimum level service bill mm. to make you know. Um, in, in the event of industrial action in the NHS mm. or other services, we have to provide a minimum level of service. Mm -hmm. The timing for that has riled people, especially at a time when we can't provide a minimum level of service when we don't have industrial action. There's, mm. We're almost drowning, drowning in the irony of that, aren't we, really? Mm. Mm. And I think, I think in, in, sorry, in fairness, I think as well, the government narrative hasn't helped. They haven't helped themselves in the fact that they've basically come out and they've told mistruths about us, mm. you know, and that was from the likes of Grant Shapps as well, um, Stephen Bartley definitely, and, you know, we've we've responded in kind because we've been able to, to kind of out those lies and such like because the likes of Gary and myself have been involved in those meetings where decisions have been made, you mm. know, when, when, they, when they lied about, and they did lie, about the, the national derogations. You know, mm. they said that we refused. No, I was involved in those conversations. I was involved in those meetings. And as such, we agreed or we said that the derogations would be better off being dealt with on a regional level because everybody knew their own backyard. Mm. I wouldn't have been in a position from West Midlands to tell Gary what to do up in the northwest in Cumbria or as part of the areas that he covers, mm. just like he wouldn't have been able to tell me what to do in the middle of Birmingham or Coventry. Mm. So, Before so starts of, texting in, can you say what a derogation is? It was the it was the agreements that we had about the types of court we were going to attend. So, like I say, when the government were trying to say that we were putting life and limb at, at risk, we were actually covering life and limb calls. That is what we agreed yeah, to, yeah. and we actually did that little bit more yeah. um, with yeah. regard to Category 2 calls. So everybody yeah. thinks that we only went to Category 1 emergencies. No, yeah. we didn't. We were going to Category 2s as well. That was already agreed. Yeah. You know, Gary agreed it up yeah. in his area. I agreed it down in our area. Mm. you know, with, with the reps and whatever, and, and GMB were alongside us down here, and mm. Gary and, and GMB and Unison up in the northwest were doing doing their derogations. But mm. you know, to say that we weren't actually supplying that cover and such like was, was scandalous, really. Yeah. Really scandalous. Yeah. yeah. Mm. I think it's been interesting, hasn't it? Because um, public feeling around kind of COVID has made a difference. And then also... The fact that you can actually get direct access now to union leaders, you know, a lot of people are on social media and the public can see genuineness. And I think that makes a big difference. Instead yeah. of having to go through a third party and hope they cover you favourably, people can get direct access. Um, I know Dave's keen to come in with some facts. So you're, Do you want to lay those on us, Dave? <laughs> Brace yourselves. I doubt any of these are going to be positive. <laughs> Well, it's just, uh, I know there's been quite a few things said that I think it'd be useful just to cycle back to. Uh, so one of them was the thing about ballot thresholds uh, and the introduction of anti-trade union legislation. Uh, and just to give the facts on that one, uh, what it says is that you must have at least uh, a 50% turnout and at least 40% of the people that are entitled to vote, vote in favour of the strike action. So what that would mean is if you got 50% uh, of people voting that can vote, uh, I think it'd be 80% of those would have to vote for the action to then be able to have it that you've got a positive uh, strike action ballot. So it's really difficult to get mm. those levels. And obviously in the organisations where you've got that, then it just shows the huge strength of feeling uh, that members are demonstrating. I think the other thing that it's important probably to say is that it, it also shows that the organisations where we can get people that are willing to take industrial action. So if you rewind 20 or 30 years, say, uh, you could have a, an industrial action ballot across the whole of the NHS. You'd get it that people would vote for it. But then when you turned around to having strike action, the people that turned out on the pickets would be uh, less than, than you would kind of expect. So in some ways, it's kind of hardened people's resolve to actually take action. Just to go back to the, that derogation point, uh, the definition that Google's saying is an exemption from it or mm. from our relaxation of a rule or law. And it is that bit about, like that colleagues have said, you know, that when we come to strike action, some people will continue to provide services, even though they would have been on strike that day. 
uh, because it's felt that that, that is a, a necessity. Uh, and, and that's what trade unions would always do. They would always want to make sure that ultimately uh, services, you know, the, the, the most important services can continue and, and are safe. Uh, and in a way that kind of is, is frustrating because it means that it's harder to, to push the government into a position. But ultimately, it's about wanting the public to have at least a minimum level of service so they're not being put at, put at extreme risk. And we'd all want that, wouldn't we, in terms of our, our loved ones, our, our family members, you know, that, that, that that's what we'd want. But what is sad is that the way that the government then rewards that, that behaviour is that mm -hmm. they want to bring in punitive bills, like we've said in terms of the minimum services bill uh, that the government's currently trying to push through. Uh, and that's obviously going through a consultation at the moment. And as you would imagine, the trade unions will be very, uh, uh, you know, against the the the, the uh, law being put on the statute books. But what you know, you would imagine is that the Conservatives, that as an eighty seat majority, will push that through, mm -hmm. uh, and hoping that you know, when it comes to the next government, that we form uh, that, that 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 they can take that off the statute books. Because ultimately, you know, strike action is a helpful thing in terms of people being able to demonstrate their real unhappiness with things. The other way that people can demonstrate the real unhappiness of things is leaving the job. And mm. again, you know, if, if that's what the government wants, then, you know, that's maybe what they will achieve. But instead of people being able to strike, they will just leave that employment and go and find uh, employment somewhere else. Uh, and, and that's ultimately what we wouldn't want because we'll mm. lose really good people that are doing really important work in the NHS. Uh, I don't know if it's helpful just to talk about the kind of offer that we got last July that, that led to the uh, the strike action. Mm. Uh, you know, we the, the the offer that was made in July 2022 uh, was for a, a minimum uplift of £1,400 in pay. Uh, and, and that was kind of uh, progressively distributed uh, with the lowest pay bands getting more. Quite depressingly, what often happens is they have to give more to the lowest pay bands because if they didn't, they'd fall foul of, of, uh, of a low pay uh, regulation. Mm. Uh, and that just shows that the situation for some in the NHS is that they get paid ridiculously lowly. Uh, actually, you know, if, if it had just been that award, which is what obviously uh, lots of our members striked against, uh, then, uh, for example, nurses' real pay uh, would have been down £1,100 this year, uh, and that's from data that the T TUC published in 2022 in July. Uh, and paramedics' real pay would have been down even more £1,500, uh, mm. and that's just in a year because of the huge RPI that we've had, uh, mm. you know, oh, oh, well over 10% for the majority of, uh, you know, the, the, the last 12 months. Uh, if you look at and compare that to pay since 2010, Nurses' real pay is down £4,300 mm. and paramedics' real pay is down £5,600. So again, you know, that reality of, you know, it's not the paramedics have become less efficient, uh, they're a bit lazy, a bit less qualified, and therefore they deserve less money. It's actually this money has been stripped out of their pockets by the government that has repeatedly not paid above uh, inflation. And so when you don't get an above inflation pay rise, what that means is even though the pounds in your pocket might be slowly going up, the price to pay for things is going up at a much greater level. So therefore, the relative value of that pound in your pocket is, is a lot less. Uh, and that's just the, the really kind of depressing uh, situation. Just one mm. more thing to say before maybe talking about the current pay deal that's on offer is mm. vacancy rates was mentioned. Uh, mm. From my sort of looking at the figures today, uh, the ambulance service as a whole has a vacancy rate at the moment of 8.9%. In nursing, the rate is 10.3%. Uh, that's about three over 3,000 vacancies in the ambulance service uh, and nearly 44,000 vacancies in the registered nursing uh, across England. Mm. Uh, and like you say, that equates to just under 130,000 uh, vacancy uh, in, in NHS England, uh, mm. which is massive. And we know one of the biggest reasons for that is the fact that pay has not maintained and has been cut mm. over the last 10 plus years. Mm. Everyone's really sad, aren't they? <laughs> Sorry. Cheer it up. I think, I think it, was, it was like on the back of that, I think mm. it was really insulting to hear Rishi Sunak on the news the other morning. 
trying to extol what the Conservatives are doing for the NHS and how much we deserve it. Well, and I sat there and, and I was sitting there thinking, well, if you really thought that, we wouldn't be in this position where we've had to go out on strike. You would have been funding it appropriately. You would have been staffing it appropriately. And then when we factor in social care as well, which is also impacting on us and how we're able to, especially with the turnarounds and everything that have been quite widely, you know, uh, reported in the media, mm. uh, is nearly 300,000 vacancies. And it's it's almost like, oh, well, we're, we're giving this this pay deal that's that's really good for them and it's thanking them for everything they've done well. What about the previous nine, ten, eleven years as well that you've, yeah. you know, used to have to put up with the one percent when Jeremy Hunt overruled the pay review body and, and such like? Mm. You know, yeah. people may have short memories out there, but we don't. You know, those of us that have been involved in in trade union activities and such like, and, and been having to fight this and been on our various committees, we remember what it's been like, and it's been consecutive. Whoever's been the prime minister, consecutive Tory government after Tory government. And and to try and smokescreen what's been going on over the last 12 years or more, it's, like I say, I find it quite insulting that they, they're now talking about this being a fantastic deal when we know, in effect, that it's it's a bit of a sticking plaster over a massive gaping wound that's there. Mm. If anyone should know the problem with that, it would be a paramedic. Mm. So, <laughs> but it's an interesting thing, isn't it? Because it is ideological now. We're at that stage. It's so clearly... Because, um, you know, you think if you save someone's life that they will understand how important your job is. Apparently, no. <laughs> um, it's yeah. not about what's real anymore. And I think particularly for um, people working in health and social care who are already living through, often on lower wages anyway, the majority of mm. people are on the lower part of, of what's an acceptable wage. You know, you have working poor, and that's absolutely horrendous to see. And I think as well, particularly for people who work with the public and particularly with some of the more desperate and vulnerable members of the public, you see what austerity looks like in terms of health and well-being, and it's horrific. And I'm not surprised that it impacts um, health workers' well-being, not just for their own difficulties of having to be in food banks and fully employed and try and look after families, but also seeing the huge impact on the most vulnerable people we've got in our society. I think one of the other things as well is, is the way that the media portray everything because they always seem to go for either the mid to higher paid um, roles within the health service. Yeah. They you find know, one person who's actually making decent you know, coin and point at them. <laughs> yeah. yeah, paramedics on band six. Well, actually, we've got band two staffing in our organisation. And, and as I've said on on quite a few of the, the media um, mm. chances that we've had and opportunities that we've had when they've come to the picket line, mm. It's very difficult to, or it's easy for me because I've, I've, I'm quite well versed in it now, but it's to remind the public that it is not just an ambulance strike, this. It's about the NHS. We are part of an NHS dispute. It just so happens that the ambulance sector has voted to go out more than some of the other areas. And it's about making sure that we don't forget those that are on band two and three in our own organisations, but also yeah. those that are out there in the wider NHS. Mm-hmm. You know, and the fact that the NHS has had to up until, well, depending on how this goes, but when you think that the NHS year on year has had to raise the the starting point of band two, like Dave was saying, so that they meet the national minimum living wage, otherwise the NHS would have been breaking the law if they hadn't have done. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. you know, we're not what the what the media portray. We're not all on band five, sixes and sevens. Mm. There's a lot of people out there on quite low wages. And as I said to one of my directors once when he said, oh, Bantus are getting 10%, which was based on the £1,400, I said, but 10% is very little. It's still very little. Mm. Yeah, It's interesting as well, isn't it, how you often see people who have no compassion whatsoever down-talking the skills that l- the lower bands have. I mean, because mm. banding isn't necessarily about experience. It's certainly not about complexity of tasks sometimes. You know, people on lower <laughs> bands are doing incredibly challenging, difficult complex work that requires huge amounts of empathy and thoughtfulness and critical thinking and i think there's a real misunderstanding of what care is in this country and and the cost that it has for people who give it and i find it really difficult when people um who don't seem to care about anybody else at all start telling other people it's a really easy job to do you like, i don't think you could do it <laughs> so it's, a, it's an interesting thing to, to see to be spoken to i think like that by people i think it's almost like a paradox as well sometimes when you hear chief yeah. executives talking of a, at acute hospitals and such like about how important 
you know, the upper levels of management and such like that. Hmm. But when you look at it, when you look at the, the legislation around IP and C and such like, hmm. if it wasn't for the Bantus and, and such like, you know, hmm. the cleaners and the porters hmm. and, and whatever, those that might be on band two or three, hmm. if they weren't there to do their job, that hospital would fall over hmm. because they would start to fail all of the the kind of standards and the, you know, the, the KPIs and everything that they're supposed to meet and, and uphold and, and such like, the whole place would just fall apart. Hmm. It's, I guess it's important to remember that the banding isn't a measure of the care that you provide Absolutely. and the value of that care that the public hold dear because mm. you know, throughout all the bands, mm. um, you know, that you think of the patient transport service and, and how valuable that is to such a range of, of patients. Mm. We, we do forget, don't we? It's a blunt tool that doesn't measure mm. care and it doesn't measure value. And just mm. one other thought on, you know, we've talked about pay, haven't we? But the the driver for this industrial action isn't just pay it's also an nhs in crisis as well and although we've heard voices of the unions those voices aren't on their own they're not in isolation if you look at the wider uh, sort of health economy you know i'm thinking of matthew taylor chair of the nhs confederation that's been on the news an awful lot over the last few months has pointed out that without industrial action without unions we still have an NHS in crisis, and that is what this industrial action is about because the NHS is, is in crisis. Pay, recruitment and retention are part of those issues, but they're not the sole issues. It's all part of a bigger picture. Mm -hmm. we've, we've had a question come in, taking us slightly off track of talking about violence because we're so cheerful. But let's, <laughs> let's, let's finish up what we were talking about um, in terms of the pay offer, have you guys anything you'd like to add about that, or how you'd like this, how you would hope that this could be resolved? From from the unite point of view, it's for the members to decide. You know, the the offer. I think I think the actions of of unite members and members of other unions have achieved a great achievement in bringing a, a government back to the table that for months and months and months adamantly refused to talk about pay and refused to come to the table. So. I think there's some great achievements there. Yeah. The, the pay deal, the implications for individuals, is it's all outlined on lots of websites, the Unite website, the NHS website, and it's for each individual to consider and, and you know vote as they see it. There are lots of, of good aspects to the pay yeah. you know, where, we, where we've managed to get to, mm -hmm. but it's not perfect. The lump sum isn't consolidated. We know, if you will, we could talk about the downsides of it for quite some time. We know that. However, okay. you know, I think members should be proud of the work that they've done and proud of what they've managed to achieve and get in this offer. Mm. And one of the things, one of the things I've I've been saying to staff when they've asked the question of how we've arrived at this decision and, and why they're being asked to ballot. Yeah. And it's quite simple. And we, we said this at the NISCA thing last week, didn't we, yeah. Gary? We yeah. said it's, it's the membership that have brought us to where we are. Yeah. And it's the membership that are going to have the final say. Um, and you know, I think I've been quite right in, in saying one of the things that the government wanted was these preconditions was that anything that went out had to be with a recommendation to, um, to a recommendation to accept. I think it's quite fair to say that Unite aren't quite like that, you know, in the sense that we've always been a little bit bloody minded. We've always been awkward and such like. And and the decision was made that we would go out to the membership, like I say, that have, that have got us to where we are now. But we will let them decide as well. You know, we weren't going to carry out to, to all of those preconditions because at the end of the day, you know, you've got your preconditions. We've got ours. And you know we've been allowed to do it so and quite rightly so so like i say it's, it's in the hands of the membership and we will abide by by what they say yeah that makes sense that makes sense um dave you've got a question from charlotte there i see yep so i don't know if anyone can help with this one uh charlotte said hi sorry i'm late i was wondering if you discussed the topic of violence in the nhs I see reducing workplace violence as a non-pay measure on the pay offer. And I was wondering how you felt about the proposed 83% cut to the National Violence Prevention and Reduction Team. Now, I don't think I know about that team. Do you, either of you guys know about it? 
No, but if it's actually going to be taking place, it seems a little bit hypocritical, doesn't it, to be saying one thing and then doing the other. Um, obviously, from, from us in the ambulance service, um, we've got body-worn cameras and such like, although sometimes it's hard enough to get staff to wear those, but mm. they do have their value and such like, um, and they do sometimes prevent somebody who might be thinking of doing something a little bit naughty. They will have second thoughts and, and not, especially when that camera's switched on. Mm. The NHS as a whole, I think, personally, I think it's a bit of a societal issue in the fact that where we are at the moment, um, and I don't think it's going to get any better at this moment with the cost of living crisis and, and such. So there's a lot of people out there, as we know, with a lot of mental health issues, whether it be severe mental health issues or right the way down to anxiety about how they're going to pay for you know, goods or food or, or whatever. And, and like I say, we've seen it with food banks and that literally being stripped of, of their goods um, and an awful lot of it lies at the hands of this government and, and can I be political yeah, say whatever <laughs> I, think, I think the only way that we're going to alleviate this and got, turn things around is to get rid of this government mm. and, and get a Labour government in that will hopefully start to turn things around and I know that a Labour government will not be able to turn everything around because we've had 12 years, 13 years of deterioration and it's going to take a long time to get us back to where we were prior to this shower taking over in 2012, whenever it was. But yeah, I, I totally agree. We've got to we've got to stop any kind of assault on any care workers, on any um, health workers. And I'd like to see the courts actually stepping up and giving out tougher sentences because time and time again. We're putting things in place to assist people. The laws are there, but the courts themselves aren't applying those sanctions, and they should be, because at the end of the day, you get a nurse or you get a paramedic or whatever that gets assaulted, that mm. person could be out of work for months and months and months, depending on that injury, and that paramedic in particular could be somebody that it could be that paramedic that could possibly have saved a life further down the line that isn't there on that particular day. Mm. So... You know, like I say, I, I totally agree with Charlotte. I think they do need to do something. And I think we need to have those conversations now with our leads mm -hmm. to see what what the intention is and, and what they're, they're actually going to be putting in place. Because I think we need, the devil's going to be in the detail with a lot of the non-pay stuff. And I think mm -hmm. that is something that we'll have to explore mm -hmm. when we when we have our future. Well, we've got a NIST coming up soon in the next couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll be able to see what actually is on the table. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm relieved the S word you used was shower. So thank you for that, Steve. <laughs> um, Gary, did you want to talk about violence before we start thinking about winding up? Because we're already here. Yeah, just a couple of points, really, that tackling violence and aggression should not be linked onto a non pay headline on a, a pay deal that we've managed to drag the government back to the table to talk about. It should be at the forefront, nothing to do with pay. This is a commitment and a moral obligation to staff. You know, this, this is, as Steve points out, the situation we have with violence and aggression in the NHS that has only increased for the last 12 years, where we've had a Tory government that could have done something tangible to tackle that violence and aggression. I, I find it a bit disingenuous to, to, to insert it where it's been inserted with actually no detail or no real level of commitment. Mm -hmm. And I know that ambulance staff are, are frustrated by the situations they find themselves in by the increase in violent situations that they find themselves having to deal with. And as Steve says, what sometimes seems like a lack of action from the, the court. So yeah, I, I'm just struggling not to riot, you know, have a wry smile at the way tackling mm -hmm. violence and aggression that should be a headline thing. Yeah, it's not a present, it's, is it? It's, a it's basic. not a present, no. <laughs> if, if you're really good, we'll tackle yeah. violence and aggression. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. I, I think... It's slightly cynical. I don't think that should have been, you know, inserted the way it's been inserted. And if it is part of a real genuine commitment, we need some meat on the bones, really, don't we, as to how the government are going to deliver that. It poisons a workplace, doesn't it? And yeah. Stephen's right, for every one person that leaves, it frightens patients, and makes them feel like they're not safe in services. It makes staff think about leaving. People take early retirement. People clear out because it's dangerous and it's scary. And that's not, it's not right to make people work that way. No. 
Um, well, let's come around to each of you to to hear any final thoughts you have. And you can be as freewheeling as you like. It doesn't matter if it's the future of paramedics, what you think is going to happen with trades unions, anything you like. So we'll come to Dave first. Dave, any any last thoughts? Yeah, I, I suppose my last thought is for all you night members out there, uh, you will soon get a ballot in terms of whether you wish to accept or reject the current pay offer in England. Uh, and what I would ask you all to do is to have a look at the offer on the table uh, and make a decision on whether you want to accept or reject. Uh, I, I was hoping Colenso would join us today and he would probably be able to say the dates for when those ballots would be hitting people's emails or uh, uh, doorsteps. Uh, but it will be very soon because mm. obviously, you know, the, the offer is now there. Uh, so, you know, vote once uh, in terms of what, what you feel is, is, is the right choice on that. Uh, and obviously, you know, I, I feel quite lucky uh, at Unite that I get to support our ambulance members uh, in their national committee because uh, I know the difference that they make. Uh, and as, as I was saying to Gary a few weeks, ago uh, a couple of his colleagues uh, popped to my house a few weeks ago to mm. drag me off the floor uh, when I completely done my back in uh, and without their help you know I would have been in real sort of dire straits uh, and that's what the NHS is to us isn't it it's yeah. the it's the thing that's always there that when it goes wrong you can press in 999 on the phone and all of a sudden these wonderful people turn up and actually uh, mm. try to make things better uh, and, you know, as with everything in, in, in life, if it, something is genuinely valuable, we need to treasure it and we need to fight for it. Uh, and certainly in terms of the work that these guys do, it's hugely valuable. So thanks, guys. Absolutely. Um, Steve, is there anything you'd like to add? Um, yeah, definitely, definitely. Fill out your ballot form and send it back because anyone that isn't is a wasted vote. Um like I've been saying to people, it is down to personal circumstances and such like, which is why we've gone out the way we have. Um, but also, like Dave said, the NHS, one of the things I've always said is that once it's gone, it's gone. We won't get it back. Yeah. It's, we've lost a lot of services already. And I think some of the reports that we've had this week about um, the likes of COPD patients and chest um, complications and such like and conditions down to people that have been losing their eyesight over the year, or yet last year or two because of um, backlogs and such like, we cannot afford to allow this to go on. So the only way that we're going to be able to to fight that is to to try and get rid of this government, but also we need to keep challenging this government and we need to keep highlighting all of these issues and everything. And the only way we can do that is with solidarity amongst ourselves as both a trade union, but also hopefully taking along other sister unions as well on that fight because. You know, I've said it before, and Gary's the same as well. In our roles, we look after our members, we're about our members, but also we are about protecting and defending the NHS. And we will do so until the day we either retire or pop off this mortal coil. <laughs> I love that. Gary, anything from you? Yeah, just um, a little update on the ballot there was a meeting today so the, the ballot should open next Friday the 31st of March mm -hmm. and the plan is for it to be open for four weeks ending on Friday the 26th of April as everyone has said the vote is really important it's vital that your voice is heard we had the meeting at the NISC and the decision was that the membership have brought the government to the table and the membership should have a voice and a vote in deciding on if they choose to accept or reject this pay offer. We do think paramedics are fantastic people. We think all ambulance staff are fantastic people and everyone in the NHS does a wonderful job. And those ambulance staff were there for you before the industrial action. They will be there for you after the industrial action. They were very much there for you during the industrial action. And although we had some government rhetoric that wasn't quite accurate, those staff provided life and limb cover weren't being paid when they were, you know, stood on that picket line on standby waiting for those calls to come in. So they've done a fantastic job. And mm -hmm. just to end on a note of thanks for the support that we've had from members of the public, from other professionals, from other healthcare professionals. I can't tell you how uplifting it is to be on a picket line when perhaps it's windy and rainy and someone just pops in just to say, I just wanted to come by and, and offer my support. 
and they'll talk about their personal experiences. So the, the support of the public really mattered, was really appreciated. So thank you for that. Absolutely. I think that's a brilliant thing to end on, actually. So thanks to all for that. So we were on um, Easter holidays for the next two weeks. That's right, Dave, isn't it? Yes, it is. So <laughs> we're on Easter holidays. <laughs> and so what we done be, today? Um, you did a little bit of a freeze there, Dave. And um, so um, we'll be seeing you in two weeks' time. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> so we'll be seeing you in two weeks' time. Um, stay safe, stay well, and uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon. And thanks very much to our guests and to all people working in ambulance services. Take care. Good night. Cheers, thank you. Thank bye you. Bye-bye.